views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Hola everyone, welcome to Open, the one and only show bringing the best of the Bronx, New York and the world straight to you. I'm Rina Valentin, your host of Café con Leche every Friday. Here's what's coming up in today's show. Leading things off, we sit with former Speaker of New York City Council, Melissa Mark Viverito, about her candidacy for uh, New York Congressional District 15, along with the 2020 census and how it will affect the community. After that, we'll talk about Perception, a short film focusing on immigration from two different sides of the spectrum. We'll have the opportunity to sit down with executive producer and actress Julia Carias Linares. And then we'll learn the details behind the 13th annual Mama's Hip Hop Kitchen event with this year's theme, Dare to Dream, when we chat with co-founder Kathleen Adams. And later on in the show, Bobby C. brings us an up-to-date with the latest headlines in the world of sports. And lastly, this week's Open Artist Spotlight features poet Chelsea Williams performing a special piece to give us a taste of what to expect from this year's Mama's Hip Hop Kitchen. So sit back y prepárate. All this and more is headed your way because now we are officially open. Welcome back to Open, everyone. I'm Rina Valentin, your host of Café con Leche. You know, we're always inviting you to get social with us. That's right, online, that is. Tweet us and follow us on Instagram at BronxNet TV or like us on Facebook at Open BronxNet Television. And, of course, while you're there, don't forget, follow me on Twitter, Instagram, FB, and LinkedIn at Rina Valentin. Our first guest is the first Puerto Rican and Latina to ever hold a citywide office as Speaker of the New York City Council, and that was from 2014 to 2017, and while simultaneously, we'll say, holding her seat as council member for the 8th District since 2006. That's a lot of years. Hmm? And during her time in the City Council, she was able to fight for comprehensive immigration reform and criminal justice reform and advocate championing the housing crisis. And now, well, she plans to run for New York's 15th congre oh, excuse me, congressional district representing the Bronx. And she's here now to tell us more about her candidacy and the 2020 census. Please welcome Melissa Mark Viverito, or should I say the Honorable Melissa Mark Viverito. Buenos dias, Marina. Thank you so much for the invitation. Buenos dias. Thank you for making the time to yes. be here. And um, congratulations on your run, right? Yes. Um, it's interesting because you've been in office for so long. I, I can't imagine what that must have felt like this time that you've taken a break. We'll say you've been on hiatus. Mm -hmm. And so what made you decide to run for Congress? Well, basically, I mean, anybody that is awake and, and knows the crisis that we're living in our country right now, where we have an administration that is so hostile to communities of color, to low-income communities, and that is the Trump administration, uh, that we also are, are in a crisis of our democracy, where he is becoming an autocrat and assuming uh, these positions that is trying to amass power, and he uses that power to threaten communities uh, that don't agree with him. So, for instance, in New York City, where we are a welcoming city of our immigrant communities and we're considered a sanctuary city, uh, now we just heard a ruling from the federal administration saying that they can take monies away from cities that are welcoming of immigrants if they don't toe the line of the Trump administration. So he's using that power uh, to be uh, represent, you know, to go against communities. And so the 15th Congressional District is an important one. And I thought that with all the experience I have, um, our congressman has served 
here for 30 years, yes, and we thank him Jose for Serrano. his service. Yes. Uh, now that that is an open seat, that it really was important to have someone there who has that trajectory of fighting for our communities, for being a strong voice, to fighting back, uh, to providing great constituent services to the constituents of the of the Bronx. And so that is why I decided to jump into this race. And obviously, we know it's it's a contentious one. Right. It, it is. There's a lot of people running yes. for it. Right. And so um, I, the, the issue that I brought you on to discuss is the issue of the yes. census. Right. And and of course, running for a congressional district. Um, I, I thought it would be great if you could enlighten our viewers on the importance of it. Right. We're, we're speaking about immigration. And I know there are lots of undocumented individuals, but I think it's important for people to understand that the census is really about keeping count of yes. the people that reside within a certain district and that and the impact that it has on the funding yes that is offered or granted to certain districts. So can you just break that down for us a little more? Yes, yeah, so, so actually in 2000, back 20 years ago, I did lead one of the local census offices here in the city of New York. The census is basically, it counts everyone, regardless of your status. It is a way of counting to figure out how many people live in that particular state, in the Bronx, in the city, you break it down by neighborhoods. So on April 1st, which is considered the National Census Awareness Day, there's gonna be a lot of uh, ads and you're gonna hear a lot about information. To get counted is critically important, not to be afraid to do so, because that is the way that we that money is allocated. When we talk about money for our schools, when we talk about money to make our communities safer, when we talk about money towards public housing, we need to know how many people live there because then decisions are being made based based on the percentage or based on the number of individuals. That's why getting counted is so important. So the first step in that process, and people will receive it, is you're gonna get a census form in the mail. And it's important to fill it out. If you don't want somebody coming to knock on your door and harass you at your door, if you fill out that form from the onset and send it in, then nobody's gonna bother you after that. Uh, the issue of hiring people on the ground to go knocking on doors is to basically follow up with those people who do not fill out the census form that has been sent in the mail. So that will be the first um, contact that people will have is the form in the mail, and then subsequent to that would be any sort of additional follow-up with knocking on doors. It also is a good job opportunity. People are being hired locally. Right. Uh, jobs are paying 25 to $28 an, an hour. hour. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, the, the issue of not only money that's coming to a communities, but also how districts are being drawn politically. Right, right because they draw the districts according to the yes. amount of people residing in certain areas, and exactly. that's how they determine, right? Now, the other thing I wanted to bring to uh, into light is that I believe that this year they're even offering uh, the opportunity to be counted uh, via uh, being online. Uh, there's this new system in development. I, I was reading about it, and so uh, I don't know how that's even, you know. That's going to be interesting. I'm not 100% <laughs> sure. Uh, you know, I know we have our concerns we see, you know, but 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 you will get, they get something in the mail, and there will be obviously, as you're saying, a, a, an ability to maybe do that online as well. Um, I always think paper, to me, is always the shortest way to get something done. Right, but, right, because it, uh, it's there in material yeah, form. Right. Yeah, I get it. And so um, just in, in discussing this, and obviously you've already broken it down with regards to districts and, and the, the line that's being drawn, but I, I, the reason I keep harping on it is because I know we're living in a state right now where people are in fear of even being recognized, you know? And so how do we break that stigma, or how do we enroll these these people to go to understand that by being counted it's actually more helpful to the situation right I mean and I think that obviously the administration did attempt um, and they did take some steps that caused alarm in our community but there is no though th there is an issue of like you're saying it's just about allocation of resources so we want to get funding to our schools you know and our children getting access to pre-k programs or getting access to food pantry or any type of benefits I mean public housing is something that we have a lot of in this congressional district um, we need that accurate count and I understand that there is a fear and a hesitation for people to get involved but that's why it's important that the the mayor and the city also take the time to go on to local Local networks like this, community networks, 
community ethnic media, right? We have such diversity in the city of New York and people get their media, uh, their information in different ways, whether it's the local community paper or whether it's their ethnic media TV station. Uh, so people, we have to get that information out of the most accurate information to try to neutralize any fear and concern that people may have about participating in something that is so critically important for the health of our communities. Um, you know, healthcare funding also, in terms of our public hospitals, allocated based on uh, use and based on, on census data. So the census data is critical for the, uh, a healthy functioning democracy, uh, and that's what we need uh, people to participate. I love how you closed it with a healthy functioning democracy. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I don't have that right now, but we gotta fight for it. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and so before we go, I understand you have an event happening on Saturday at the co-workers? Oh, so I, I do have, uh, we all, those of us that are running for office um, in any any category, any level of government, we need to get on the ballot. And so we are in the process of gathering signatures. It's a petitioning drive. Uh, so we I encourage people to come out and participate. Uh, there are many people I that know me and are familiar with my work. And if you want to support me, then we would ask people to to um, to stand up and help, and help out. So it's at the co-working space, as you said, on both Saturday and Sunday. So uh, thank you. And thank you. Thank you for making the time to be here yes. with us. And thank you for your service to our Always. communities. Thank you. All right, you guys, once again, for uh, more on Melissa Marbivirito's candidacy for New York's Congressional 15th District, you can visit mmvforthebronx.com and follow her at mmvviverito. That's on uh, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And, of course, uh, for the census, you're going to be receiving that in the mail. But if you want to learn more, just go online and read about it. Um, it's very important that we all be counted. All right, we have to take a quick break, but when we return, we'll get a sneak peek of an immigration short film. Don't go anywhere. Praise the Lord, I'm Evangelist Barbara Mayo. I have a program called The Great God. I come on every Saturday at 3.30, Channel 70, and 36 on file. You need to catch me because it's a, current, a, a program to encourage, to lift up, and if you don't know anybody that uh, 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 haven't heard about the program, tell them about it. They'll be encouraged, for God is good. God bless you. Welcome back to Open, everyone. So immigration uh, continues to be an issue within our society. And so this new film entitled Perception, it tells the story of immigration from two points of view. It showcases how two parallel worlds suffer from society's pressure resulting in life and death decisions. Let's take a sneak peek of the short film, Perception. Criminals all come to this country and destroy what we work so hard for every day. I'm just thankful that that man is in the right chair at the right time.
And joining us to tell us more about the film Perception, please welcome executive producer and lead actress Julia Garias Linares. Hello. Hello. And welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, you know, I know this film was being created about approximately two years ago. A year ago. A year ago. Yes. And um, I know that the, it's being premiered here in New York, but uh, the fact that the, the it, it's a timely piece. Right. Um, and most importantly, it's not necessarily about the Mexican border, which right. is very interesting. Right. So, you know, based on the conversation that was just previously had in, in the segment before, let's talk a little bit about immigration and how it relates to you and why you chose to not only executive produce the film, but be one of the stars in the film. Well, for me, it was very important to talk about this topic. Um, it, it has been part of my uh, story since, you know, I came to this country and just seeing and, and having it so close to proximity, um, it was important. So when I, I actually came in as an executive producer first and we were trying to cast and we couldn't find the right person. And so the writer director said to me, you know, you an actor, why don't you, you know, why don't you read and, and see how it goes? And so... So I just want to just clarify something for the uh -huh, audience. It's uh -huh. like the character is Honduran. Correct. Right. So I just want to make sure that they understand right. that because it applies to what this country is built on. Right. And so uh, just... But right. I didn't no, mean to interrupt, no, no, but no, I want no. them... To, I wanted the clarity so that they understand that it, it's coming from all different angles. Absolutely. And the director wanted it to be a Honduran, not only a Honduran... Uh, because it's a Honduran character, but for the actor to be Honduran. Right, but he's also Honduran, Correct. the filmmaker. Correct. Correct. And so I initially, you know, was hesitant because I have so much on my plate. But then I thought about it. I mean, this is a story that is important to me because at one point I was undocumented. Right. I, you know, I, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm proud to say that, you know, my parents have worked really hard. Obviously, my status has changed. Right. So let's talk about that period, right? Uh -huh. Because you play a mom in this film, Correct. and you have a daughter in this film, right. and so you're at a you're playing the other role. Right. But there was a point where you might have been that little girl. Correct. At some point in Correct. your life. So, uh, what age were you undocumented, and what kind of uh, I guess fears you had to overcome? Sure. I mean, it was it was very fearful. Um, I got here in 1984, mm -hmm. and we did, I didn't change my status until 1995. So that was a long period. I, what was, I think, to working... To be uncertain. Right. I couldn't travel. We couldn't travel. Um, it was, there was fee, constant fear. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, once I, I uh, became of age to be able to work, I couldn't work. And it was very difficult. It was a very fearful, I felt different. I felt like an outcast. And so for me, you know, to be able to change that, it, it was such a relief and it was such a drive to show that, you know, as an immigrant, we come to this country and we come to contribute, right. not to take. Right. And so happy to, you know, be able to be, uh, uh, um, what do you call it, a member of our society. Yeah, that member is, of society, I mean, a that... success story. How about that? <laughs> I mean, you were an executive producer at a and &E. I know you oversaw uh, a few channels, right, FYI? So, yes, I worked for FYI. I worked at Lifetime, worked on some of the uh, top-rated shows on FYI that went to Lifetime after that because Lifetime is, was a bigger channel. And, um, and it's just been, you know, quite a ride, Rina. And I just want to you know, create stories that are going to be reflective of the people, of who we are in our community. And so that's why this story was very important to me. It's lovely, and thank you for sharing all yeah. of that. And so the film itself is how long? It's 15 minutes. It's 15 minutes, and um, I introduced uh, the narrative being coming from two different perspectives. Correct. And I understand, I don't really want to give too much away. However, uh, the idea is that the story taps into just racism from both perspectives. As someone being raised in like a white supremacist environment who doesn't really approve of certain ways. Right. 
right? Right, absolutely. I'm not so, giving too much away. No, no, okay. no, no, not at all. So Daniela um, is the character that I play. She's forced to leave her country. Um, and then you, you see these, this other parallel story of Alan, who is a young man struggling with being in a racist family and wanting to change that and not wanting to be a product of his environment. And so I think it was a hopeful twist because I know that we're dealing with a, a lot of racism, but not everyone is a racist, even when they are in, in that environment. Right. And so I just kind of, we wanted to give it a hopeful twist and uh, hopefully we'll have you know, enough people coming out to see it and support it and to support this so important to uh, topic. Right. You know, that we need to be talking about it. We need to be uh, doing a lot, you know, and, and participating. So I was excited to... Not, not just shooting it, but supporting it. Right. Because we, we, we need the ticket sales. And, and it's not really about the ticket sales. It's about showing the interest, right? Because once the ticket sales are there, then it shows the interest in the topic. And now we have a stronger voice and it should be coming from all angles. Absolutely. And we need to continue to talk about it and do something about it. And hopefully this film will, you know, uh, entice people to get involved, uh, go to the census, right? Like we were talking about earlier, right. or participate and um, and just you know continue to talk about the conversation about this conversation. And so I, I I think it's lovely that you you decided to just you know go full circle and and go back to your roots in re-experiencing -ex uh, or recalling on a certain time of your life because you're so far from there right now. Mm -hmm. So I can only imagine what that must have been for you. But I, I did want to make sure that we left on a really high note. I mean, not that the film is in a high note. I think we've already expressed to you guys the importance of what it means to support our work. Mm -hmm. And when I say support our work, I mean our people of color work because we have a tendency to just go for the commercialized topics and um, and our stories need to be told and the way we are able to produce them is by supporting them and that's why you're here so and I, I just want to share that with our viewers and um, and then on that note I, I before we go I, I want to also share what's coming up okay. in addition to the film. Yes, we have um, a, a show, a series called Big Deals in Fancy Heels, and is a, a series, a non-scripted reality show that features four strong women in the real estate space. The characters are, di are diverse. Um, we have a Latina, we have a Persian, we have uh, uh, an Italian white, but we also have a Brazilian. And so the idea is to, again, showcase our community in a positive, um, creative, way and and for I felt like for me it was important to give the next generation of young women um, a story a platform where they can see women working together because we see a lot of the opposite right, right now especially right. in reality television oh my gosh it's all about cat and fights so, yes yeah that's, so, that, that's what gets the ratings and so <laughs> when, yeah, absolutely and yeah. so I called um Three of my friends who are very successful producers, I pitched them the idea. They loved it, and you know, we decided, why not? Let's 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 do this differently, right? And so we're going to be. I'm gonna hopefully we'll get the exclusive where we're gonna be um, uh, d distributed. And, right. Uh, I know you gonna... already shot the pilot, so I'm yes. looking forward to hearing yes. what the next steps are. But uh, thank you for announcing it here yes. on our show. Is there anything else you wanted to share? Because uh, I know you can't share too much. No, I can't share too much but it but it's exciting and um we i can't i we can't wait to premiere so yeah and and i just want to acknowledge you uh for being a woman who operates with purpose uh you know you've been in the tv field for quite some years and um i know it's a a market that you can kind of like be jaded and just <sighs> yes. go for the ratings and go for the money and it's challenging to create and or produce uh, content that is meaningful. Right. So I acknowledge you for that. Thank you. And I thank, thank you, you so for much. bringing it here with <laughs> us and sharing it with our thank viewers you. and you guys. You once again, me. Perception. Perception is premiering this weekend. It's premiering at the 11th annual Bright Side Tavern Film Festival. And that's happening on Sunday, March 1st. I believe it's airing at 1.45 p.m. Rather, you know, they're screening at 1.45. I'm used to television. And for tickets, you can visit 
brownpapertickets.com. And once again, if you want to follow Julia, you can follow her on all social media platforms at Julia Carias. So Del Valle Productions and Casting is seeking talent for a new TV animated series that will be starring Puerto Ricans from the Bronx. The production company is looking for African Americans and Middle Easterners and bilingual kids from ages 5 to 11. No experience is needed. And for audition instructions, you can send age and contact info to, write this down, info at Del Valle Casting. Casting.com. Once again, info at delvallecasting.com. All right, we're taking a quick break, but coming up, we'll talk about a dare to dream theme when we return. <laughs> built a media network for you. Bronxnet TV. Come learn in your new state-of-the-art studios at Lehman College. At Mercy College. And coming soon to the South Bronx in the hub. Inspire with your stories, culture, history. Your Bronx on Bronxnet. Engage with us. Connect with us at your channels and at Bronxnet.tv. Learn, engage, inspire. Bronxnet TV. From the Bronx to the world. <laughs> Bronxnet. <laughs> Welcome back to Open Everyone. You know, always inviting you to get social with us. That's right. Tweet us at BronxNet TV and tweet me too at Rina Valentin. This year's, uh, well, this year's Mama's Hip Hop Kitchen is celebrating its 13th annual event. I'm so excited about that. Um, this event is like one for the records every single year because every year women come together to share their stories and showcase their talents to serve with social justice activism at the forefront. And well, they're also building community that educates, empowers, and showcases women of color on issues that impact their lives. And this year's theme is Dare to Dream, um, which honors all who have taken on dreaming despite the obstacles. And joining us to tell us more, please welcome Mama's Hip Hop Kitchen co-founder, Kathleen Adams. Hi. Hi, good morning. Oh my gosh, this show is like perfectly themed, right? Literally. We just had a conversation with our previous guests about what it took to get to that place of success, right? Exactly. Despite of the obstacles. And here you are honoring that uh, for the next generation. Yeah, so we are really excited to be gearing up for Mama's Hip Kitchen Volume 13, Dare to Dream. It's taking place on Saturday, March 7th at the Hostel Center for Arts and Culture. Um, and Every year I come back, I'm like, I cannot believe we've got another year. We've got another year. So 13 years, it's absolutely crazy, but we're so honored to. So, you know, the 13 years, right? And, you know, we've been here servicing you guys as best as we possibly yeah. can, contributing and supporting and promoting. And every year you come and I always look at the flyer and I always go, look at this flyer. It's amazing. And the titles and the the actual concept, like how, where does that come from? It's really serendipitous. Like it comes through the vibe that we're feeling or the tone for the year. It actually takes a lot of time. We should 
I wish that we, I was saying we were being as proactive in creating a theme once the event ends for the following year, but it doesn't happen that way because you need to see how the year goes right. to set a theme that would make sense. So yeah, that's kind of what happens. Then Latere, my co-founder and myself, we come together and we say, oh, I'm feeling this way. I'm seeing this in the community. What do you think? And then obviously we try to um, create a tagline that makes sense. Dare to Dream actually was inspired um, by Mia Roman. She is in our show. She has a fashion line called Yo Soy Mia. And um, she's been doing a ton, taking like her beautiful patterns and graphics and et cetera, not just on artwork, but it's like taking it to like the clothing arena. So she's actually going to have a Yo Soy Mia mini fashion show within Mama's Pop Kitchen. Nice. And she was talking about daring to dream and stepping out of the boundaries. And that's how we decided to like dare to dream. With our add our flavor to it, but yeah, that's where we're no, at this year. No, that's dope. And and the reason, it, it, the other thing is, is how you dress her up, right? Um, she is the logo of Mama's Hip Hop Kitchen, and I noticed this year she's got an indigenous feel to her. Last year was African themed. Exactly. So Too Fly, who is an amazing world famous graffiti artist, is our designer, and she actually will be on site at our event having a table. Um, so we work with Too Fly. We send her some images of like the inspiration like what we're looking for we sent her like a text write-up of you know the information about our event mm -hmm. and she really goes from there and it's it's a right really nice partnership because all of our creative juices are flowing together and you know she's an amazing graphic artist we're really great with the branding side so bringing the two together really helps us create great artwork it, it's amazing it's a, it's really amazing and so inspirational to see how you, you guys work this every single year um the event itself is from two to five yep. at hostos on uh, and i know it's, that's coming up the, the next the following saturday yep. uh but the fact that you also make it affordable uh rather it's free yep. i shouldn't even say <laughs> affordable because i mean there's vendors out you know they have vendors out there so that uh, there's some kind of contributions being made, but the fact that you're able to even offer it at at a free cost, at no cost, I yeah. should say, in the main theater, and the main theater holds what, like about a, a thousand. thousand people, and you fill it up every single year. Yeah, so we're really blessed to have Hostos Community College be our partner with that. Um, they've given us the space, and so that's how we're able to um, make this event work on that scale and magnitude, so we're really excited. The vendors, I love the vending aspect because we're really shining light on um, community vendors who are actually out there in the community. People say it's like Christmas where they go and they do all their shopping. So people are really supporting the vendors. We also have free confidential HIV testing. This year is provided by Harlem United. They will have a mobile unit parked right in front of um, the school. So it's great. Um, I'm really looking forward to this year. We also have a- How many vendors all together? Um, we have, I want to say this year, I want to say like 25 to 30. We're still accepting. 25 to 30 vendors, right. So the reason I, I'm bringing that up is, is because you make it free, right? Yeah. And, and that, that within itself kind of just says that this isn't really about making the money, right? But if there's vendors there and, and there are artisans, they're there to support the cause. However, they need to, you know, make money in order for them to buy supplies. And also it's kind of like, generating the revenue within the community so that there's this flow of energy of support. Most definitely. So we're really excited about that. We still have a couple more tables open because Hostos actually allowed us to have more tables this year. So if you want to apply to be a vendor, just go to our website, mhhk.org, click to where it says vendors tabling. We'll go from there. Um, but then also our lineup this year. We yes, haven't really I was just new... gonna ask, like, talk to me because it's always exciting. You have people that come from different parts of the United States. So yeah, this year we actually changed it up quite a bit. We have our legacy artists. We also have a ton of new artists. Um, we were really thinking this year, like, entertainment in general. Yes, there's still a focus on hip hop, but it's an expanded vision and view. So like, I'm really excited. We have a comedian, um, Faria Khan, who is really well known in the community. It was we her first time performing with us, so I'm really excited about cool. that. Um, we have Naochi, she is a spoken word artist. We have Chelsea Williams, who you'll hear later on today. Yes, she's gonna perform here on set. amazing um, uh, spoken word poet. Um, we have actually a, a masterpiece, I guess you could say, which is a, a multi-layered piece choreographed by Rockefeller, who you know. Right, who's also one of your legacy artists. Exactly, right? but also um, layering it with other legacy performers, next level dancers, and Femme Fatale from the New, uh, New Settlement um, community organization, but they're collaborating together to create this like 
three-part piece. So I'm excited. I actually haven't seen it yet, but they've been talking a lot about it. So that that relationship happened because they got to know each other throughout the years. It, at Mama's Hip Hop Kitchen. At Mama's Hip Hop Kitchen. Lovely. Um, we have Dizzy Sins, who's an amazing Bronx uh, hip hop artist. Um, We've got so many, so I'm really excited about this year. Oh, also, Harlem School of the Arts. I'm really excited. I actually serve on their associate board. Yay, we love Harlem School of the Arts. They're amazing, literally. And I was like, for years, I was like, why have I not had them in Mama's Hip Hop Kitchen? So I've gotten more and more involved with the school. I reached out to uh, Leyland Simmons, the artistic director, and I explained what I was doing. I was saying, you know, your students are so talented. How can we have them be a part of our show? So... This year they'll be performing. I'm excited and hopefully can continue that relationship as the years continue. That's lovely. Wow, it sounds really exciting. And and so all of this is happening simultaneously. And what I love about Mama's Hip Hop Kitchen is like you kind of can go sit in the theater and you can step out and go mix and mingle. Vendors. You go back in, you come out. It, it's kind of it's really really a nice vibe and a loose kind of feeling of yeah. just hey, let's just be together exactly. and empower each other Definitely. and be a stand for each other. And uh, and we also we're we're always so grateful that you bring it here to our audience, and hopefully you guys will uh, be able to get out and appreciate it for yourselves. Any last words? Um, please come support Saturday, March seventh, uh, two to five p.m. The atrium opens at twelve noon for the vendors to be tabling. So come early to support. It's a great time. It's family friendly. It's free. It's for Women's History Month, so please check us out. Right, so it starts at 12, but the show itself starts at 2. So people can actually start getting there early and shopping and, and just, like, visiting all the, the kiosks because there's yeah. a lot of tables. Right? Exactly. So, yeah, so as I mentioned, the tabling starts at 12 noon. Doors for the show actually open at 2. The show starts at 2.30 and on time at 5. So you've got a ton to do. Check it out. Drop in for the day. And all ages welcome. That's the beauty of yeah. it. Thank you. So thank you so much for having oh, me. Of course, Kathleen. Thank you for the work that you're doing for our community and the next generation of girls. Thank you. All right, you guys, once again, Mama's Hip Hop Kitchen, Volume 13, Dare to Dream is taking place on Saturday, March 7th from 2 to 5. That's the actual show. Right, the show starts at three, but you can get there at noon, and I highly recommend you get there at noon because I'm telling you, it's a great day and a great way to spend your afternoon. And that's happening at Hostos Center for the Arts and Culture. And for more information, you can visit mhhk.org, and of course, you can check them out on Facebook. Uh, they have an events page there with all the details. All right, stay tuned. Bobby C's weekly sports roundup is coming up next.
This is Bobby C. out at Rose Hill where we begin our look at sports this week with the game of the week, courtesy of the Rams. Fordham hosting the 20 and 7 Rhode Island Rams at Rose Hill Gym. At just 1 and 13 in conference play, Fordham entered as the heavy underdog, but this one would go down to the wire. Jeff Doughton uses the screen and knocks down the jumper. Then it's Doughton again, this time from the corner. Joel Soriano uses his size on the other end with a nice post move. But the first half would belong to Tyrese Martin off the Darren Russell miss. Martin is there for the putback not once, but twice. Martin also showed his range from deep with a three-pointer to give Rhode Island the 26-19 lead. Two seconds to go in the half. It's Martin again hitting the jumper from downtown as time expires. Tyrese Martin would finish with 24 points and 16 rebounds, both game highs. URI leads Fordham 41-35 at the break. We go to the second half. Martin can't corral the pass stolen by Jalen Cobb and served up for Erton Ghazi, cutting the lead to four. URI takes advantage of Fordham's sloppiness, stealing the pass, leading to the fast break, and a monster slam from Tyrese Martin. But Fordham turns up the defensive pressure, trapping down in the corner, forcing the turnover and the fast break layup. Just over four minutes to go. Kyle Rose passes it cross court to Chris Austin for three. The lead is cut to two. Still trailing by two. Gazi again comes up huge, sinking the corner three. Fordham takes its first lead of the second half. 26 seconds to go. Antoine Portley misses the three from the same corner. Soriano grabs the rebound, but is called for traveling. Six seconds left and down by one. Jacob Tobin is fouled with the pressure on. Tobin gets the friendly roll on the first. And on the second, nothing but net. Rhode Island takes the one-point lead. Last chance for Fordham. Josh Cologne cuts to the basket. No good. URI survives a nail-biter, taking the 76-75 win. Here's Fordham coach Jeff Newbauer on the tough loss. Our guys have been determined all year, and so we've certainly come up short a number of times. But, you know, our guys do love to compete for each other. They do play for each other. And, um, you know, tonight was another example of that, where our guys played a great game, and uh, we just have to play a little bit better next time out. Tough winner for the Fordham men, especially in A-10 play, where they only have one win on the season. Injuries have doomed the Rams all year long. The conference tournament looms in mid-March. Heck, anything can happen at the Barclays Center. And in March Madness, been a so-so season for the locals on the college hoops hardwood. The Iona men are 9-8 and eight in conference play. The Manhattan men are 8-9 and nine in the MAC. And in the Big East, St. John's is 3-12 and 12 in league play. Seton Hall still represents the best of the tri-state area. Miles Powell and the Pirates are ready for March. The best men's program locally here in New York might very well be Division III Purchase College, which topped Sarah Lawrence in the semifinals Thursday night and is heading to the Skyline Conference Championship game on Sunday against rival Yeshiva. The championship will be hosted by YU in the city. Good luck purchase. On the women's side, the Fordham basketball team is vying to repeat as A-10 champs this winter. They are 18-10, and 10, including 10-5 and 5 in league play and scored a huge win last week over then undefeated A-10 opponent Dayton. Excited to see the Rams dancing again in March Madness. For more, check out BronxNet's latest episode on the of the Ram with Coach Gately airing now on BronxNet. My Yankee season preview is coming undone already. Two of my five keys in the hunt for World Series number 28 are down. One loss for the season, the other may miss opening day. The Yankees absorbed another injury to one of their star players on Wednesday as outfielder designated hitter John Carlos Stanton is considered questionable for opening day after being diagnosed with a grade one right calf strain. Yankees manager Aaron Boone said that Stanton sustained the injury while performing defensive drills at the George M. Steinbrenner Field Complex on Tuesday. Boone believes Stanton will be 
up against it a little bit in terms of time to be ready for the March 26th season opener against the Baltimore Orioles. Meanwhile, right-hander Luis Severino underwent Tommy John surgery on Thursday. You have to be kidding me. His 2020 season is over before it even began. The Yankees added that Severino had an existing bone chip removed from his elbow during the procedure. Cashman announced earlier this spring that Severino, who was limited to three regular season appearances in 2019, had dealt with forearm soreness dating back to October when he made a pair of postseason starts for the Yankees. The team shut down Severino last week after he had gone through his normal throwing program to start spring training. Next man up 2020, the sequel. In spring action, the Bronx Bombers have won three straight, including Thursday's 7-1 win over Tampa Bay that saw back-to-back -back homers from Tyler Wade and Clint Frazier and another sterling outing from Jay Happ. My solutions to the Yankees' woes in the C-list. The Mets have dropped three straight in spring action. They resume today against St. Louis and face Houston on Saturday. I'll have my Mets season preview on Monday mornings open. Time for some quick hitters from around the world of sports and motor racing. Will the third time be a charm for the Triple Crown for Fernando Alonso? Retired Formula One driver Alonso has secured a ride for this year's Indy 500 following ill-fated attempts to win the race in 2017 and 2019. The Spaniard is looking to become the second driver in history to complete the Triple Crown of racing by adding an Indy victory to his wins at the Monaco Grand Prix and the 24 Hours of Le Mans. Graham Hill is the only driver to win the three major events during a racing career. In tennis, Maria Sharapova is calling it a career. She was a transcendent star in tennis from the time she was a teenager, someone whose grit earned her a career Grand Slam and whose off-court success included millions of dollars more in endorsement deals than prize money. And yet Sharapova walked away from her sport rather quietly on Wednesday at the young age of 32, ending a career that featured five major championships, time at number one in the WTA rankings, a 15-month doping ban, and plenty of problems with her right shoulder. Interesting story there. The NFL Combine took center stage this week. The New York Giants are watching closely. They have the fourth pick in April's upcoming draft. Could they be adding a quarterback by way of free agency? We've heard several teams mentioned as potential suitors for soon-to-be free agent quarterback Tom Brady, but we hadn't heard the Giants until now. The NFL Network reported that the G-men have been named by sources at the scouting combine as a potential team with interest in Brady, along with the Tennessee Titans and the soon-to-be Las Vegas Raiders, whose potential interest has been discussed in the past. The Giants would be a surprise, of course. General Manager Dave Gettleman spent the sixth overall pick in the draft last year on, you know, Daniel Jones, of course, and the team has indicated that Jones is the quarterback of both the present and the future for the Giants. Doubt Brady comes here, but you never know. On the ice, the San Jose Sharks fought back against the New Jersey Devils, posting a 3-2 comeback win on Thursday night that snapped a five-game skid. The Isles wound up in the loss column, too. Red Hot St. Louis posted their sixth consecutive victory with a 3-2 win over the New York Islanders last night. And speaking of streaking clubs, look out. The New York Rangers are on fire. They may have stolen the trade deadline by simply not trading Chris Kreider and extending their star for seven more seasons. Ryan Strom scored twice and added an assist as the surging Broadway Blue Shirts rallied past the Montreal Canadiens 5-2 for their fifth straight victory. Over in the NBA, Philly topped the Knicks 115-106. The Knicks will now host Chicago Saturday at 5 p.m. at the Garden. As for Brooklyn, the Nets are in Atlanta tonight. Those are the, the headlines. We hit the C-list for a game plan for the injury-riddled Bronx Bombers. No Stanton, give me Clint Frazier. No Seve, I'll take some J-Hap. The Yankees will enter the season and as the favorites in the American League East, but their rotation depth is already being tested. James Paxton is expected to miss at least the first month due to his own injury, and Domingo Herman will miss time due to a suspension stemming from his violation of the league's domestic violence policy. The Yankees lost 2,908 days to injury. Did you hear that? In 2019, the most in the majors. When the Yankees signed Garrett Cole, the expectation was that they would look to move Jay Happ to save money and avoid luxury tax penalties. Instead, the Yanks kept Happ. That looks very wise right now. Happ didn't have a great season in 2019, yet his seasonal line suggests that he was more than serviceable. Happ figures to slot in as New York's third starter to begin the season before sliding over to the fourth spot once Paxton returns. Whatever the Yankees do, they are a worse team, of course, without Severino. But I do believe some of these youngsters, including Davey Garcia, can help the Bombers make up for the loss. The team won 100. 
three games last year essentially without Severino and Stanton. Clint Frazier has let his bat do the talking this spring. The brass young outfielder came into camp last spring boasting that he would take an outfielder's job after a roller coaster 2019, a year that had him playing a big part in an offense hit hard by injuries, but also creating unnecessary headlines and irritating front office personnel and teammates. Frazier is speaking through his work these days on the field. That's good news for the former 25-year-old first rounder. Also good news for the pinstripers. Frazier homered for the first time this spring in the first inning of the Yankees 7-1 win over the Rays yesterday. It was a good reminder of what Frazier is capable of. Stanton, who played just 18 games last season, could miss the start of the season. And Aaron Hicks will miss the start of the season after October Tommy John surgery. While the Yankees are trying out Miguel and Duhar out in left field this spring, Frazier is likely to get a chance with the added 26th roster spot. I would carry him from Florida up to New York to start the season. The question with Frazier has been if his bat can overcome his poor defense and drama that surrounds him too. Spring is always a new chapter in baseball, if not a clean slate for the players. These are my internal options for the Yanks. As opening day nears, there's always the trade deadline in July. If Happ and Frazier aren't the solution and Stanton just can't stay healthy throughout the year. That's your sports. I'm Bobby C. to open it's now time for this week's open artist spotlight this week's open artist spotlight features a poet and filmmaker from uh, the south side of chicago her writing contemplates the particularities of black life her ancestors and what it means to be a black woman. She's performed in venues across New York City, and she's here now to perform for us. Here to perform Womb, please welcome poet Chelsea Williams. I remember waiting in my mother's womb, the water up past my temple, her heartbeat closer than my own breath. This was my first home. This is where I learned that all beginnings have an end. I burst into existence wrapped in screams and a pink blanket. I was made from the softest parts of her. The curve and walls of her belly whispered to me in the middle of the night. My mother told me to breathe in and out. She told me to let go, and ever since then, I've been trying to learn my lesson. There was a time when I left daughter in the place in the place where I was from. I left daughter locked in the door of the house I grew up in, and there I returned home in shadows. I showed my mother that daughter would be the end and the beginning of her. I am more like my mother than I know. My mother is a black woman, the daughter of teachers, a businesswoman. She fought her way into rooms with white men who do not want her there who are shocked to discover that a woman like her can do anything more than clean up after their messes. She laughs at their bad jokes and brings her money home. My mother is good at her job. Sometimes her job is making them believe that she cares what they say and closing a door on the parts of her they would not accept. My mother has never heard the word beautiful and thought of herself. My mother is my definition of beautiful. 
When I go back to the question of who I am, I think of her face, framed by the icing crust in our bathroom mirror, her gapped teeth, a door left open, the oak ocean of her skin, enough of an answer. It is because of my mother that I know home is the place I rest my dreams and build my children's. Wherever my home ends up being, I want her there. My mother was born a river curling around the wilderness of her childhood. I am a wave still finding my way to her shore. I am a current flowing back to her body of water. Her and I stand braced against a steady foundation. We are four walls, a fortress. Thank you. That was Thank beautiful. You. Thank you so much. So mesmerizing, wasn't that? Thank you. Yeah, I know. It's, it's you didn't get there's people here in in the uh, <laughs> in the studio. Yeah. I know. It's just like we're not in this theater, but trust me, everybody was applauding you. That Thank was you so much. truly mesmerizing. Thank you. <laughs> yes, and your mom must feel really proud. Yeah, yeah. I do all of my work for her and for my family, and you know, I think including my story in my work is a big part of what I'm trying to do. So. All of your work is about your mom? No, no. Um, you know, I try to include parts of my stories. And sometimes I'm talking about my mom. Sometimes I'm talking about Chicago. Sometimes I'm talking about just black experience and, like, black history, too. And I try to make all of that, you know, come together in a, in a way in my work. That's beautiful. So how many pieces do you have all together? Uh, probably about 50 in, in uh, everything that I've written. Yeah. You have 50? Yeah. Wow, yeah. that's lovely. Yeah. And so are you going to be performing this piece at Mama's Hip Hop Kitchen? Yes, I am. Next week, uh, March 7th. And I love that, you know, Dare to Dream was in there. Mm -hmm. Well, not Dare to Dream, but the term dream in there. I, I, I just love the piece altogether. I Thank mean, you. it was really mesmerizing, and I was there with you uh, just floating through the water <laughs> and, <laughs> and just yeah. vibing back and forth and understanding that connection. And so, you know, because you honor your mom and because you're so proud of your roots and because our show has been themed uh, towards and, and geared towards immigrants mm -hmm. and, and people of color, and, mm -hmm. and while we are at the end of Black History Month, uh, what, yeah. what would you like to share with our viewers? Um, well, I think a big part of how I see art uh, is just viewing, you know, our personal experiences and our daily lives and then also how we connect to the places that we come from. Um, for me, I, you know, I'm trying to make a way for myself as a poet and as a filmmaker, but at the same time, the, the Chicago, my heart, the people that I know, they're a big part of who I am and a big part of what I try to bring with me in every room. Um, so just, like, never forget where you're from and, like, It'll make you special, I think. That's what's up. I like that. Thank, Thank you. you. That was perfect. Thank that you. Was perfect. <laughs> that was perfect. That's it. Here's to be your <laughs> true, authentic self. All right, once again, you guys, Chelsea Williams, thank you for being here with us. And she's going to be performing at Mama's Hip Hop Kitchen, Volume 13, alongside many other featured hip-hop women artists. Once again, Mama's Hip Hop Kitchen takes place Saturday, March 7th, from 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. Again, you can arrive at noon, and that's happening at Hosto Center for the Arts and Culture. For more information, check out the event page on Facebook and um you can also find Chelsea on Instagram at chelseaw.art. Also, make sure to, another uh, event for you guys to consider is to check out Mike Robles. Uh, he's from the cult classic comedy Rumba on BronxNet, and he's going to be performing Living for Laughs on Sunday, March 1st at Caroline's Inn. The all-star comedy event is a fundraiser for the Emmy Award-winning comedian to support his battle with cancer. Uh, the show starts at uh, 7 p.m. at Caroline's, located at 1626 Broadway. And for tickets, you can visit carolines.com or you can call the box office at 212-757-4100. And, uh, well, that is our show today. But before we go, we wanted to make sure we wished uh, a happy birthday to BronxNet's executive director, Michael Max Navi. Here's to wishing you blessings, and many, many more. All right, that is our show today, mi gente. Thanks to all our guests for coming through, to our viewers for tuning in. If you missed any part of the show, you can check out the Recable cast tonight and 24 hours a day at BronxNet.tv. I'm Rina Valentin, and from all of us here at Open, may the universe provide paz, prosperity, y amor. Adios.